character and uh, the character of God. And I'm sure you guys have seen in movies or read stories about where a mother or a father literally ran back into a burning house to save a child, disregarding their own safety, disregarding the effects of what would happen to them. They didn't even think about it. They just did it. Now, mix strong character and that kind of love together, and it still doesn't match up to God. You'd think because you live with someone for a long time, you'd know their character. Is that true? <laughs> you might know a little bit about them, I guess, but at the end of the day, how do you really know someone's character? Do you really know your closest friends? Do you know how they think? Do you know what makes them tick? Do you know their character? Do you know what they do in front of you? Because that's what's obvious. But do you know their character? And I was reading, actually I was watching an interview and uh, then I studied a bit on it. I searched it up a bit and I thought, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, CFB Trenton. Anyone of you heard of that? CFB Trenton is one of the, well it is the biggest airport in Canada for the military and I was looking at a guy by the name of Russell Colonel Russell William he was an upstanding citizen actually when he was a kid he he, he had excellence on his mind from day one he became a pilot at a very young age he never really had any problems in his life you know most kids are like we were got into trouble <laughs> Well, he wasn't like that. He was very focused. He grew up, he enjoyed flying. And eventually he worked his way all the way up to be the commander of CFP Trenton. You should look it up. CFP Trenton, it's, it's, a, it's a very prestigious place to be the commander in chief. It's the biggest Air Force base in Canada. So it shows you, his character showed us he was hardworking. His character shows us he was focused. You know what, this is, when I researched a little bit about him, this is what they said about him. They said he was the guy who visited his secretary in the hospital when she was sick. He was the kind of person that helped with a fundraiser for the sick cousin of an employee. And he was, I guess, normal on what we would call normal. You know, he liked golfing, he liked fishing, he liked playing crib. He liked being with his friends and neighbors. He was married to Mary Elizabeth Harriman, who was the associate director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. So they both had pretty high level jobs <laughs> that required a ton of a commitment, a ton of work, and you would think a ton of character, wouldn't you? From what everyone could see, Russell William was what? He was an above average man with a great life, right? And you know what that does in our minds? That puts him in a separate category, doesn't it? <laughs> that means, well, he's better than me. He worked harder than me. I don't have that kind of character. So you know what it does? It kind of gives us the pass. But actually, let's look a little closer. Colonel Russell had never been in any trouble. Any trouble. Until 2009. Until 2009, he could no longer hide his true character. He couldn't hide his cravings, his hidden desires. They wrote this in the news. He was the real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. By day, he was an upstanding guy, but by night, he became a monster with a criminal, with no criminal past or seeable triggers. At the age of 40, he became a monster who tortured, raped, and killed unsuspecting women. When he was caught 
and he was being interviewed, I watched the entire interview. He literally showed zero emotion. He talked about killing, brutalizing, and doing things that no one should do. <laughs> like as if it was just a matter of fact, this is what happened. How did a guy that had been a normal upstanding guy live his life up to 40 years old as a good person suddenly completely deviate into a monster? Psychologists couldn't see any triggers that would have set him off. One of the last questions the interviewer asked Russell William, and I watched him ask this, he said, what would have you done, or no, would you have done it again if you had not been caught? And Russell replied, I was hoping not. God's character, on the other hand, is bulletproof. His character is out in the open for all to see. He has not left a breadcrumb trail for us to try to figure out what he's all about. He has a mountain of proof to show us who he really is and what he is really like. God's character is not appetite driven. Russell couldn't hide his secret cravings. When he turned 40, he said, I don't care anymore. He isn't subject to impulsive choices. He doesn't have a deviant behavior. God is what? What is God from the Bible? What is God? God is love. He is self-sacrificing. He is a restorer. He is a builder. He is the author of life. When our humanist tries to drag God down to our level so we can figure him out, guess what? He's beyond that. We want to relate to an undefinable being. There are not enough words. There are not, there's not enough time in eternity to describe all he is. God is not a man that he should lie, change, act selfishly, but he is spirit. He is truth beyond measure. The scripture reveals to us some of his character, not all of his character, some of his character that we can actually comprehend. If we will pick up some of what he has laid down for us in scripture, life will become much lighter and fuller. Isn't it true that you, when you understand someone more, when you can relate to their character more, you actually can actually be better friends. But when I got all kinds of weird things going on in my head about Bob, Bob, that he's saying this behind my back, I bet money on it. I know Bob. No, I, I do, you know, no, just trust me on this, right? That's how all kinds of weird things go on in our minds. And it doesn't stop with people. It's usually with God. We got all kinds of weird things going on in our mind about God that isn't scriptural, isn't biblically based. And that's how we had an explosion in the 19th century of how many different religions, a bunch of cults, things that man said, I think this is about God. I think this is God. I think this, I think that. You know what? The devil in his psychosis lost connection with truth and life. Sin leads to death. The day you eat of this tree of good and evil, you will die. Jesus said to Satan, there is no truth in you. Satan is filled with vileness. He is disillusioned and full of destruction. And so are his followers. One minute, this is almost laughable, but unfortunately it's true. 
One minute he tells his people they can have fame and fortune if they follow him, and the next minute he is leading them down the road to their own destruction. He has no remorse for his own followers' sufferings because his hate and pride are so large for himself. Now let's look at God's character. God is El Shaddai. What is that? It's a song by Amy Grant, I think. <laughs> but what does it mean? El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. So we know something about his character. The Lord God Almighty. He is not a person or entity attempting to be godlike. He is God, the Lord Almighty. God is God and he always will be God. Anyone remember that song? He's the God of the fiery furnace. He's the God of the lion's den. He's God of all creation and he's God in the hearts of men. We'll probably add that to our songs. <laughs> The real question we need to be asking people, is he your God? Jehovah Tids Kenu, the Lord our righteousness, another character trait. 1 Corinthians 1.30, God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit, made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. God pours into you and me his wisdom, his righteousness, his holiness, and his grace that raises us above the grip of sinful cravings that lead to hope, a hopeless future. When we start understanding the character of God, number one, we start feeling like we can approach him and we start feeling like we can rely on him. Man, I really wish I could pronounce these words better. <laughs> Jehovah Mekodesh Kim, the Lord who sanctifies you. I have tried many times to measure up to the standard that God would think is good, and every time I have what, what, what do we do every time we think we're doing good? What do we do? We usually end on a fail. <laughs> I was doing so good praising God in my house until I stepped out and seen my stinking neighbor. Right? I was driving down the highway. I was praising God, worshiping with the music until that jerk cut me off. <laughs> I failed with my thoughts. I failed with my actions. I failed with my deeds. But the Lord who sanctifies you doesn't quit that easy. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He is the one that is sanctifying us. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What's the theme? Don't let your Bible become a monument. Use it and use it and abuse it. Open it, read it, reread it until the pages fall out. <laughs> know the truth because the truth will set you free and the truth will remove the lies that have stained our minds. That's God's character. How many people in the world you talk to? Oh, religion, that's just to control you. That's to hold you back. Yes, to hold you back from the garbage dump. <laughs> Jeez, I held my son back from touching the element that was red hot. I'm such a mean person. God's character tells me this. He will help us even when we hate it. He'll try to save you when you're trying to drown yourself. He'll try to cut the rope when you try to hang yourself. That's his character. 
I am love. I can't do anything else. You see, Mr. Russell had a secret evil part of him that he hid for 40 years. God's part isn't secret at all. He said, I'm love. And the devil keeps trying to convince people, yeah, that, that's a very, there's a lot of, there's a lot of caveats with that love. That's what he tells Christians. There's a lot of caveats and you've broken several of them. So you're not getting his love. You're getting only a partial part. The only problem with that is that isn't truth. That's a lie. We don't sanctify ourselves. We don't measure up no matter how hard we try. And yet he still loves us. I might have to do this every Sunday for the next 50 years, but the truth is until we get it, it doesn't change our life. We don't have freedom until we're free in Christ. We don't have freedom until we understand that God isn't your enemy. He's not your, your gym instructor that's making you work out harder than you ever thought should be humanly possible. He's actually a father of love that says, I've seen where you've been and I still accept you because I will sanctify you, I will renew you, and I will transform you. That's his character. God's character is about making you into the person of self-respect, into a person who is whole. The world system under the rule of the devil is about control, about subduing those who are weak, domineering the very people under your care. That's the devil's version. God comes to reassure, build up, and clean up for service in the kingdom. And you know what's the result? Another character trait of God is the result. Jehovah Shalom. This one I think we all know. Shalom. The Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. How many times have you met people that said, I'd give anything for a peaceful night's sleep. <laughs> Satan robs his servants of peace. He is merciless, ruthless, and heartless. He does not have peace for himself. So how could he offer to those under his control or in his kingdom? It only makes sense. You can't offer what you ain't got. Satan doesn't have peace and he never will have peace. So he can't offer peace to his followers or people in his kingdom. God is known by his children for being the God of peace. I feel so light, like a weight has been lifted. Wow, what peace. How many times have you heard that? When someone becomes a Christian, it's like a huge weight is lifted. And then sometimes we allow ourselves to take that yoke back. Because the devil says, take a good look, man. This is your name on here. You really should take this back. This was yours. Didn't you lose this? You should take this back. The guilt, remember? You should be wearing this. Remember those deeds you did back when you were 14? You should be, you should be taking that with you. And God says what? God's character is what? Well, I cast that in the sea of my forgetfulness. I don't, I don't remember. I don't know who, what you're talking about or who you're talking about. Because that person you're pointing to, I sanctified by the blood of my son. But how many times do we forget who we are in relationship with and we accept the lie of the enemy? So therefore we don't live victorious and we don't live above the water. We are bobbing up and down in the water. <laughs> Peace of mind in troubled waters. Peace of heart during heartbreaking circumstances. Peace in the face of persecution. That is a child of God. You know, a lot of people say, if you're a Christian, you're going to be trouble free. But that's a lie. Because the Bible teaches the opposite. You will have many troubles in this world. You'll be tested in many ways. But if you're my child and you understand where you are, seated with me in heavenly places, you'll have my peace. And you know what? A Christian's peace is not limited to circumstance, and it's not circumstance driven. Because a Christian believer's peace is not earthly in its origins, but is a gift from God of love. 
Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. You know what? Don't hang around it. Live it. <laughs> Don't hang around it. Live it. Apply it. Live in the peace of Christ. I have an old proverb here. When there is righteousness in the heart, there is beauty of character. When there is beauty of character, there is honor in the home. When there is honor in the home, there is order in society. And when there is order in society, there is peace in the world. That was written by a missionary. Two artists set out to make a picture representing perfect peace. The first painted a canvas depicting a carefree lad sitting in a boat on a lake without a ripple to disturb the surface. The other painted a raging waterfall with winds whipping the spray about. On a limb overhanging the swirling water, a bird had built its nest and sat peacefully brooding her eggs. Here she was safe from her predatory enemies, shielded and protected by the roaring falls. The first was only stagnation. The last was peace. Think about that. Sometimes we curse God for the raging storms. We question God's character for the turbulent waves. And God's saying, I put you here for a reason. For in peace there are two elements, tranquility and energy, silence and turbulence, creation and destruction, fearfulness and fearlessness. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What's God's character? to offer peace even in the midst of the worst storm. If you live long enough, you are going to deal with some heavy, overwhelming things that aren't fair, aren't right, don't make sense. And his peace will be there to comfort you, to lead you through a very difficult time and sometimes it takes many years sometimes it takes a few days sometimes it takes a few seconds I don't know but I do know one thing he extends his peace because that's part of his character God's names don't only identify who he is but they tell us what he is his names reveal the mystery of who he is. And I've, a lot of scriptures that we sometimes quote like as if we don't, they don't mean anything or they're so familiar that they lose their meaning. And one of them is the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Your name is set apart because it is worthy of absolute devotion. Nehemiah 9, 6 says, You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. God is absolute without flaw. Do you know what? El Shaddai the Lord Almighty has broken the change, chains. He has set the prisoners free. He has healed the sick. He has brought to life those dead in sin, dead in addiction, dead in defeat. He has brought to life those already decaying in their endless cycle of self-abuse and self-destruction. 
And then I started thinking, you're right. <laughs> when you're dead, how loud have you ever heard a dead person cry out for help? I've never heard a dead person cry out for help. When you are dead, you can't try to do better. When you are dead, there's no more trying to impress the Jones. When you are dead, you stink. You're decaying. When you are dead, there is no more pretense. The game is over. When you are dead, you're cold. When Colonel Russell Williams talked, he was as cold as ice. You look up that interview, it'll haunt you. As he described smashing her skull with a flashlight, and he li literally goes, it caused more damage than I thought it would. Zero emotion after degrading her, raping her. When you're dead, you're cold. When you're dead, you don't care. There's no feelings. El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, save me when I was dead. Dead in my own sin. In my dead state, he reached into my lifeless being and breathed resurrection power back into my being. The truth is, I'd been around the church my whole life. So what? That doesn't make me a, a Christian. A lot of people say, you ask them about, are you, are you a Christian? You know what they say? Oh, I've gone to church with my parents. I don't care. <laughs> like that means something. I drove by a Porsche dealership. It didn't make me an owner of one. Well, I wish it did. That would have been quite nice. <laughs> you know what? It takes understanding who God is. But then it takes humbling ourselves and saying, God, you're so overwhelming. Like when Isaiah said, I'm going to die now because I've seen God. And God said, no. And what else changed? When Isaiah humbled himself, what happened? He, became, he had a heart that was changed that said, I want to serve. Because God said, who am I going to send? And Isaiah quickly said, here, my Lord, I'm a filthy, dirty man. But if you could take me, I'll, I'm willing to come. And God sanctifies us. Wow. So unlike religion. And there's no chart to check off for your name. You, 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 it's not there because the checkoffs are beside God's name because his character covers our pathetic character. It is only by God's grace that I stand before you today. I was dead and buried in my sin. I couldn't save myself. I couldn't get out of the casket. The evil in me that I was was my master and I was its slave until Christ set me free. You know what? Until we're honest and say, I can't set myself free. Everything that's evil that I do, I like. It's Christ that sets us free. It is not right for me to talk about the one who saved me from drowning in an eternity without hope. Or is it? It is right. Is it not right to talk about the God of hope? Is it not right to share about the one who gave me a future, who gave you a future? Is it not right that I remind everyone that there is an expiry date to this offer? If you care about your friends and family, you're gonna understand not everyone goes to heaven. There is an expiry date to the offer that God gives. So many have known the touch of the master and have turned away to embrace death full-heartedly. If we want to base it on the scripture, the scripture says it. 
I've tried to call out to everyone, but only few are gonna respond. That's what he said. So the truth of it for us is this, we need to make sure we know our God, that we actually know his character. You know what, I've listed off a handful of characteristics about him. There's probably, uh, I don't even know how many there is, probably a hundred, more than a hundred maybe, that we've recorded. And then there's probably a ton more that we didn't have the brain power to figure out. <laughs> Know who he is. Know that it is only by his saving grace, by his sacrifice, by his death, by his resurrection, that we can have life eternal because we believe in him and his work. It's not our works. It's, it's, that's the sad part. We keep defaulting to religion, which says I can work my way into God's good books. And God keeps thinking, you guys obviously haven't read the Bible. <laughs> Remember that part about me sanctifying you? That part about me saving you? That part about my Holy Spirit leading you into all truth? The devil plays what? He plays games in our mind. Acts 2.24 says, But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death could not keep him in its grips. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But because of his great love for us, God is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I can't uh, give a good theological expose here for the ending, but I can tell you about my own life. You know what, my wife and me have been married now for 11 years. And guess what? We're still getting to know each other. We are growing in our relationship. It deepens and strengthens the bonds of love we share as we grow together. And as we grow in our understanding with God, it will bring each one of us to a deeper understanding of who he really is. He is the God that cares beyond description for each one of his children, and it breaks his heart to see them turn and walk away to self-destructive lives that lead to eternity of separation from his love. The Bible says we know in part here, but when we see him, we're going to be changed and we're going to know him in full and be known. God, we just pray that, that our hearts will not be deceived, that our minds will be opened to your truth, that we will live in the freedom that you have intended for each one of us to live that each week won't be an endurance, but will be an expression of the freedom that we enjoy in you. And because we know the love that you have for us, it will set us free to reflect it to those people we come in contact with. It won't be religious. It will be just telling the story of this is my father's love for me. He has so much love for each one of us and he wants to share it with you too. You know what? You know what keeps people out of church? Guilt. Self-condemnation. And God, what did Jesus say? I don't condemn you. I have a plan. I have a purpose. I have so much more for you. And at the core of my being, I want to lavish my love on you because I am the God of love. So Lord, set us free and help us to distinguish between the Holy Spirit and the lies of this world. 
Help us to be a reflection of your glory with our, in our jobs, in our marriages, in our day-to-day -day interactings with the people we work with, with the people we come in contact with. May we be like Moses when he came down from that mountain, that the radiance of your presence was shining out from him. God, transform us, renew us, you know, we're not beating our hands against our chests. We're not praying long prayers of all kinds of babblings. We're just humbly saying, God, open our eyes, change our hearts. Here we are. In your name we pray.